Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to screen the 1989 Israeli production, Echoes of Conflict. This is an anthology film, three short films that run about an hour and a half. And it's films that have a common theme, and that is the conflicts within Israeli society brought about by the Infatata, the Palestinian uprising. We'll be talking about the three films, the way in which they represent a kind of new stage in the development of Israeli filmmaking in, in its treatment of a number of political and cultural themes, as well as a number of other things. Today, it's a pleasure to welcome to City Cinematheque Alex Massis. Alex is a veteran of the Israeli film industry and also an activist in Israeli and Palestinian affairs. Now, take this opportunity to explore some of the aspects of Israeli society in Echoes of Conflict. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to, to, to see three distinct views of a particular moment uh, in Israeli history. And we have someone here today who can help us guide us through understanding what's going on in each of these, each of these works. It's a pleasure to have here at City University Television, uh, Alex Massis. Alex is a veteran of the Israeli film industry, has worked in it for well over 30 years in a number of capacities ranging from public relations to producer. Uh, he's also been deeply involved in Israeli-Palestinian affairs for a number of years on the peacemaking front. We're all very happy <laughs> to, to report. Alex, you know the history, because you've lived the history, uh, extremely well. This is a film that's made in 1989, uh, the, the, three, the, the three films. Could you locate that in history for us? Um, what has happened? What, what, what is the response? What is it that these films are responding to in a very concrete sense? The three pictures are really responding to the awakening of the Israeli public and especially to those who are on the front line with the Palestinians. Uh, 89 is already 13 years after the occupation. And it went, it takes time, like in a shock treatment. In the beginning, the country was elated by the victory and by the performance of the Israeli army, by the failure of the Arabs, and by, uh, so to speak, the materialization of the Zionist dream. That's what we couldn't get in 47, 48. All of a sudden, it got because of the default of the Arabs and the Palestinians, and the Jordanian, the Syrian, the Lebanese, the Egyptian, and so on. But it says in Hebrew, lo leolam chosen, which means it's, it doesn't stand like this for a long time. Okay. There is an erosion. So if we, we see the three people in the three uh, fisherettes, uh, one of them is a policeman, or a, it's not really a policeman, he's a, in the reserve. Right being called to help the police to find the, so to speak, illegal uh, Palestinian working in Tel Aviv. Right. The other two are people in the age of going to the army for the reserves. So you can imagine that they are in their thirties. So you see that it's an all new attitude. Okay. If this picture were made in um, 82, 83, right. they probably would not be made. <laughs> this is after the shock of the Lebanon war. 82, 83, Israel, the state of Israel, the government of Israel went to Lebanon to destroy and smash and terminate the Palestinian force. Right. The political Palestinian force, because Arafat was there. Not only the army, the army was also in Tunis and Saudi and Jordan, they couldn't chase them everywhere. Right. But they wanted to liquidate Parafat and his headquarters. It didn't work. Not only didn't work, the Israelis came out of the war defeated, politically and uh, mentally. So this is the aftershock. Okay. 
This is very interesting because we've seen films uh, here that we've, we, we've shown before, uh, which are very much about you know the heroic moments uh, from clearly from a Zionist perspective, I mean, it's very ex explicit of either the founding of the country or the triumphant earlier days uh, of of the country, and that and all countries make films like this at particular moments uh, in their history. And it's also true that in the history of many national cinemas, there then comes a time in which exactly those founding visions are put into a kind of crisis by historical events, and you get a kind of counter cinema, a cinema that's, uh, that's revising and uh, that, that's coming into some kind of accord with what the public's new understanding of themselves or what their history, uh, history is. Look, uh, cinema, it's a medium like any other medium. You can write in books uh, poetry, you can uh, interpret like the Bible, you can write pornography. It's still a book. The same as the cinema. Right. You can put whatever you want on the negative, and the public will judge it or not, if they will see it or not. Here, th these three pictures are really a political message by the people who wrote it and did it. And the, the message is that uh, you can occupy other people. You cannot. You cannot. It's impossible. It's the same situation like uh, warden and prisoners, right. uh, like policemen and suspects. There is a point where, of course, in political, political situation, not crime. Right. Crime is different. But political situation, there is a point where the occupier, and especially in Israel, when the, it's an it's a army of the people, right. it's reserves. Right. It's not a career army. Very much like the drafts in Vietnam. Right. Unlike Korea. And then the occupier all of a sudden realize that uh, it's not clear who is occupying who. The three pictures, especially the two, the first and the third, show the transition where the occupee become the occupier. Exactly. Psychologically and mentally. And the occupier, the two guys, in the first one and the third one, became, they are degrading themselves, and uh, they going uh, through a transformation of inferiority complex. Absolutely, I think mean, absolutely the case. And there's this breaking down of identities, and this questioning of which side is which, and can you really tell which side is That's which? why the second picture, it's a little bit outcast. Indeed. Because it's really has n not much to do with Arabs. The, the, the guy who come to uh, sleep there and supposedly have an affair or didn't have an affair with the wife, which is not clear and it's not important, is really a medium. He's only a catalyzator of the whole story which has to do with Argentina and not with right. Israel. Right. But, you know, well, it's but there. I think, I, I it's think, there. no, no, no but, but I think it, it is, it is there, and, and we wouldn't want three stories that are uh, just little variations on the same thing. And there is the the, the larger question raised by um, this: that that to what degree is Israel still a refuge for people? Because uh, that's one of the images, mythological images of of the country, is is this home and. What we get in the story is somebody who has immigrated there after the time of terror in Argentina from 76 to, to, to 80, 83. Um, and Argentina has had, of course, the largest Jewish population in all of, all, all of Latin America. The uh, fourth biggest in, biggest in the world. In, 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 in the whole world. Oh, uh, America, Israel, the Soviet Union, and Argentina. I, I, indeed, uh, I've had the pleasure of being in Buenos Aires and feeling as if in certain neighborhoods I was in New York. <laughs> oh yes, I was. Uh, in, in more ways than one. I uh, was there many times, also under the generals three times. And, and so, well, so you also know of what is um, about what they're speaking in yeah. terms of this sense of coming there and there being the the repetition of the experience. Now there are key differences though between what happened in Argentina and what happened in... If I was a producer, I will not put this picture in. Okay. I will put it in another picture. You see, the first, first come first. 
you said about the transformation from Zionist, let's say, uh, Il 24 doesn't answer, to this uh, trilogy. In fact, Zionism never um, uh, professed or advocated the expulsion of uh, Arabs. Even Jabotinsky, who is the, the leader, was the leader of the right wing, Herut, and now the Likud, he was uh, more democrat and more liberal than many of the labor parties. He advocated that if the prime minister will be Jewish, the president will be Arab, and vice versa. Uh, uh, Zionism uh, always recognized that there is, there is another people in Israel. Of course, in the beginning, they didn't know simply. Right. They thought they are coming to a desert. But later, they understood that there must be an, an, uh, some solution. So there is no contradiction between Zionism and between uh, most of the people, I mean, by numbers, most of the people in Israel who are advocating now uh, a solution of two countries for two people are Zionists. I'm not a Zionist, but I'm not an anti-Zionist. Right. So uh, even the communists are not anymore anti-Zionists. It's too late now to be anti-Zionist. So the, point, the, the Argentinian element here is completely different because the Israeli government closed their eyes traditionally, and regardless which government, if it was in 78, like you said, it was the Begin, and 82, 83, it was still the Begin, by the way. Yeah, it was the Begin government. But uh, Rabin was there, so I don't remember. I think it was the Minister of uh, Defense. Um, so many governments. <laughs> <laughs> it's a parliamentary. You're better keeping up with them than I am. It's okay. parliamentary system. <laughs> um, they always close their eyes of what's happening in uh, Argentina. And it's important to, to say it here because, because it was the biggest, uh, the fourth biggest uh, Jewish uh, center in the world, still is uh, the fifth or the sixth. And, um, and because of uh, the, your uh, mentioning of a refuge, now, if there is a crisis now in Russia, immediately they are sending hundreds of uh, what they call shlichim, delegates, right. to Russia to, to bring them to Israel. They are, not bringing, they are not coming. They want to go to the United States. It's different. They never did it in Argentina. They absolutely ignored that the majority of the victims in Argentina were Jewish until today. Okay. They don't mention it. It's not, not an holocaust and not a disaster, not a pogrom. There is nothing. They simply, they were red, they were communists, they were Trotskyists, they were anarchists, they were Che Guevara. They don't belong to us. This is, the, this is one of the, 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 it's the second biggest problem in Israel, or the conflict. This conflict has to do between the European Jews and the non-European Jews. Argentina is a European. Right. It's the only European country in South America, but not for the... Not for the European Jews in Israel. <laughs> they, are, they are Sephardim. Right. Even so, <laughs> no. what, what do you mean they are Sephardim? They are white. <laughs> but, so it, it's not for this program. <laughs> let's, uh, let's leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. OK. OK. Well, let's talk about, the, let's talk about the, the other two. Uh, first of all, the situation in the first film. Um, it's, it's night. It, the film is quite dark. The film is called Night, uh, a night movie. But for, for an Israeli audience, where much of this action is taking place, I think is, is, is obvious. And so therefore, they can locate the action, not just materially where it is, but what, why, where it is, is significant. Tell us a little bit about the geography of the story. It takes like, like place in, um, in Tel Aviv. This is uh, Tel Aviv. There was a city, there is a city called Jaffa. This is the biblical uh, city. Yes. When the, when the first Jewish neighborhood in, in Palestine uh, started in Jaffa, and then they went north, and that was Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is the hill of spring. Right. So in '48, when the Arabs ran away from Jaffa, regardless the question who caused them to run away, but they ran away, most of Jaffa became empty. So they put the new immigrants from Romania and Bulgaria and Poland into there. Okay. And they're there. So the action in this first episode is in Jaffa. 
Okay. And the closed uh, shops are the flea market. Okay. In daytime. Okay, because I think certain people could confuse this that they're actually somewhere in the occupied Tories, but it's not. Because it looks the same. Exactly. No, that, that's, <laughs> that's another it's one. It's an absolutely. The, absolutely. It's another yeah. one of those visual ironies that the film likes to deal with. And I think that's, that's more obvious to an Israeli audience that would recognize this, that it all looks the same, yet we are in a, uh, a, in a Jewish you city. Know, no, Israeli in, city. Israeli city. Yeah, you, see, you see that in Israel there are many cities, I mean several cities, who are in the same situation. Beersheba have an Arab side. There's no Arabs, right. but looks the same. Akko, of course, Haifa, Tiberias, no Arabs. In, in Akko and Haifa there is a big Arab uh, population. So there are some mixed areas. Ramle, Lud, they look the same. And of course Jerusalem. Right. But, uh, but that was Tel Aviv. Because he says there that then, um, He's asking the boy where they are taking you. Indeed, And he yes. said Jaffa, to the station in Jaffa. Right. But even after um, 50 years now, they call it Jaffa. Nevertheless, there is no Jaffa okay. anymore uh, politically. Right. So who is, uh, let's reconstruct just some of the action. So what are we to assume uh, about this boy? Why? I mean. The boy, the boy is an illegal Palestinian worker in a restaurant. And the man is a reserve uh, soldier that's being drafted for this uh, three, four, five weeks to the police. Okay, and that's why they're thrown together. And I guess another one of the points that you brought up earlier that I think is so interesting is about, uh, you know, anyone would sensibly have fear of going into a situation of high physical danger or whatever, but this is also a situation in which uh, during uh, this particular period, it is after the war in Lebanon in which uh, the toll of all of this is something that, has, that bears an extraordinary weight upon the young people in the reserves because they have a stronger sense. And their parents. Indeed. And their parents. You see, this is a, a process that started with the independence. Then there was this uh, dirty war of England, France, and Israel against Egypt. Right. But this episode somehow fading out because of all the other wars. Right. Then there was a big... The Suez crisis, as yeah. referred to. And then, you know, but Israel, they call it Mifsa Kadesh, you know, some biblical name. Kadesh is the place where they uh, moved from uh, the Jews from Egypt to uh, Israel. Right. I mean to right. Moses. Anyway, uh, and then came the Sinai. Um, sorry. The Six Days War, right. which is now the 31st year right. war. Hard to believe. Yeah. Right. So as I said in the beginning, it simply is not the same generation anymore. You see, when I was in the Six Day War and in the Sinai right. uh, invasion of uh, Egypt, I was the second generation of my parents who came immediately after the, sec the First World War. Right. But in the Six Days War, which is the third, the first right. year's war, it's already the beginning of the third generation, or the reserve of my generation. Right. But in the October War, which is now 25 years right. past, this is already the third generation. The Lebanon is the third and the fourth generation. Right. And it goes like this. Right, absolutely. So, with every generation, or a portion of a generation, of a split of generation, the enthusiasm for war is fading down. Not because they like the Arabs, no. Because they don't want to fight for a lost case. They know it's a lost case. Victory and victory and victory and victory, and we didn't win. So many victories. <laughs> Somebody's not doing the right math, right? No, it's like a casino. You put the quarter and you get four quarters, and you put another quarter, you get 250 quarters, you put, you get mm -hmm. another thing, and then you put and you lose everything. Right. It's a casino. Yeah. There is no way to win this war. There is no way. It must be a political solution. And the two of the pictures, the first and the third one, they simply give this atmosphere that they are fed up. Right. The guy in the first one wants the, the boy to disappear. And there is this tragic end. And the guy in the bar 
is, uh, he wants to bury himself. Right. He's so desperate when he comes back for the Absolutely, night. Absolutely, yes. And the middle is different. But you see, the, the, the situation, if we speak uh, from my other hat as a producer, <laughs> there's nothing original there. Okay. You know, the, the two guys, uh, I mean, the boy and the, and the soldier, uh, chained to each other. You saw it in so many <laughs> oh, no, no, Hollywood it, pictures. Absolutely. No, no, no. The, in, in a certain way, these are exercise films uh, that are exercises in well-known uh, genres of short storytelling uh, and in which it's a kind of it's the kind of application of well-known stories to a new situation, to a new historical or social social situation. So instead of it being in a U.S. film, a, a racist and a black, you know, chained together, and we've seen that yeah. any number of times. Here we have the reservist and the young uh, Palestinian. Or instead of it being a uh, American household in which uh, the young man of the household is always like the black servant in the household, then he finds out yeah. that the father, that, that, that the son or the cousin or the nephew or whoever has been involved in the civil rights movement, and this is the son. You have so many variations. You see, yeah. this picture was made in 1809, so we are now speaking about nine years later. Exactly. Right? I don't think they will do it again. I mean, if, I mean, you can't make such an assumption, of course. But if these people will, by magic, right. were born nine years later and do it in the, in the same stage in their life this year or the next year, they will not do it. Because the conflict is not anymore with the Palestinians. The conflict now is between the Jews, or the so-called Jews, the right. Israelis. Right. Because now, prob probably, I, I imagine for myself, I, I don't know, uh, this kind of people, you know, beginners or filmmakers, right. you know, they will uh, look on the conflicts of the murder of Rabin. Right. I think they were made already, a few pictures. And about the settlements. Right. Which are sitting there in the middle and uh, preventing any kind of a political solution. Right. Unless they will be thrown out from there. This, are, but in 89, ah. that was one year you see, there is a reason why it was done in 89. In 88, Arafat was in Stockholm, in an international convention, which, by the way, was organized by an American, by Rita Hauser, a Republican. Right. And he declared, after a lot, a lot of negotiations that took over, you know, in the peace camp, which I participated, uh, his basic recognition of the rights of the Israelis and the Jews for their own uh, political uh, homeland. That allowed, so to speak, give, gave the permission or the, the political uh, allowance to these people to do these pictures. Okay. Because the situation arose and was existed from 67. Right. And it took another 12 years until these pictures were done. No, no, no. It, it, and, of course, it's it's all young filmmakers at a particular moment want to take what is of the moment because they want to address an audience in a subject. Yeah, they can the do it before because oh. the, the money comes from public funds. Eggs. The school is there. I believe they are students or, yes. or came out from school. The, the, and even if the teacher and the faculty and even the people who sign the checks agree with them, most probably, they will not do it. After so. Arafat, came in public and said that he recognized the right of the Israelis for their own homeland, then it was allowed to do it. So that's the, it's the, the political circumstances allowed it. Well, and that's, uh, that's, that brings us back to this issue of, a uh, big issue of what is Israeli cinema, and I, I say that in the, in, in the singular, and one of the things one finds um, is that there is there is a lot. Of, there are a lot of Israeli films, but uh, Israeli cinema for a small nation demonstrates a, an enormously wide spectrum of filmmaking styles and uh, genres and and perspectives. There's no single uh, thing. You see, Israel is a unique country. It's not. It's not a country like any other country, uh, culture-wise. Uh, 
It's very, very similar to America, to the United States of America, but here it's a huge country. Right. 280 million people spread on South. Israel is uh, less than the size of New Jersey. 24,000 kilometers. Right. So it's unique because there are so many books published there, almost like in America. Theater. You look, you come to Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Haifa, Beersheba. Every night you can see six, eight, twelve different shows. And that's beside the, uh, you know, musicals and concerts and opera and all this. The motion picture is the same. It's the desire of the people who come from so many cultures and are exposed to so many cultures, especially in the last 10 years, because of the satellites and because of the um, waving of the restriction of traveling. Right. Until about uh, 50, 10 years ago, you needed a, I needed a permit from the army to leave the country, even right. if I came to see my parents. Right. I was wasting at least half a day to go to the camp and back, even when I was 50 and 55. Right. So the, so Israel all of a sudden uh, became more open, also because of the Arafat uh, declaration, more acceptable. And there is a lot to say, right. a lot to say. But there is very few people to listen. Hebrew, it's not a spoken language. Right. And because of political reason, Israel doesn't have this uh, proximity. That Iceland have 240,000 people, right. and nobody speaks Icelandic. But they have Denmark and Sweden and Finland and Norway and the Nordic part of the world to co-produce. Israel have a, a co-production agreement with several countries, but they have nothing to co-produce. Okay. We're going to have to leave that as a big hanging question mark at the, at the, end, of this, at the end of the show, but, but it leaves something very nice and Simply open. Simply answering what you're... Absolutely. Um, if you'd like to have more information about City Cinema Tech, drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop it to City Cinema Tech, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Alex, thanks for being here and bringing an extraordinary knowledge of the industry, the culture, the politics, and all that stuff. It'll be a pleasure to have you back sometime. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you for joining us and watching City Cinematheque today, and I hope you'll tune in again soon. Thanks for joining us again. Bye-bye.